Good afternoon. My name is Simo Zenius and I am the Associate Director of the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture. On behalf of our center, I wish to welcome you to the celebration of International Greek Language Day. Today's event is co-sponsored by the General Secretariat for Public Diplomacy and Greeks Abroad of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Hellenic Republic and by the Consulate General of Greece in Los Angeles. It is a joy and an honor to partner with such institutions in the common pursuit of promoting Greek language and culture. I would like to acknowledge Secretary General for Public Diplomacy and Greeks Abroad, Professor John Chrysoulakis, and the Consul General of Greece in Los Angeles and friend of the center, Evgenia Benyatoglu, who is with us today. Since its first steps, our center saw the promotion and the teaching of Greek language as a core component of our mission. In collaboration with our close partners at UCLA, the Department of Classics, we offer courses in modern Greek language that cover a broad range of needs, from heritage and foreign language learning to academic research. Our language courses, which have proven to be very popular with the students, build on strong existing traditions at UCLA in the teaching of ancient Greek language and other varieties of Greek. They are complemented by a wide selection of offerings in Greek literature, art, culture, and history from antiquity through Byzantium and up to the modern period. Our center also regularly hosts distinguished speakers from institutions in Greece, Cyprus, and abroad lecture on Greek culture and history. Greek language is not, of course, only an object of academic study. For Greeks and Cypriots, it lies at the core of our identity. It is a conveyor of shared values in Greek-speaking communities across the globe. Any celebration of Greek language, especially one that takes place far from the borders of the motherlands, is also a celebration of diasporic communities of their history and their heritage. We see the community as a partner in the promotion of Greek language, and we pursue this shared goal in a variety of ways. Each year, the best student in beginning modern Greek receives the Gas and Judy Christopoulos Award for Distinguished Performance. I wish to thank Gas and Judy for their generosity that supports this public recognition. In addition to our courses at UCLA, and in collaboration with the St. Sophia Foundation, we offer Greek classes specifically designed for adult learners. Our book club meets regularly and discusses major and recent works in Greek literature. We host the Kuventa language table, which gives the opportunity to our students to interact with native speakers of Greek from the community. We also serve as an examination center for Elinomathia the only certificate of proficiency in the Greek language that is offered and recognized by the Greek state. We look forward to welcoming young students and their parents on campus as soon as public health conditions permit it and to contribute in this way to the cultivation of Greek at young ages in the schools of the community. In celebrating International Greek Language Day, we do not only commemorate the history of the language and its influence, but we also acknowledge our collective efforts and we reaffirm our commitment in promoting Greek language and culture. To this future and with you, we look ahead with excitement. Proceeding to today's event, we will listen at the first part of it, recorded greetings by the Consul General of Greece in Los Angeles, Evgenia Benyatoglu, the Deputy Minister for Diaspora Greeks, Mr. Konstantinos Vlasis, and the Secretary General for Public Diplomacy and Greeks Abroad, Professor <laughs> John Chrysolakis. Dear guests, thank you for participating in today's celebration of the International Greek Language Day. We are honored to have two videos from the Deputy Foreign Minister for Diaspora Greeks, Mr. Konstantinos Vlasis, and the Secretary General for Public Diplomacy and Greeks Abroad, Professor John Chrysolakis, addressing our audience. It is my great pleasure to have my friend, Professor Catherine Morgan, lecturing us today on Know Thyself 
ancient proverbs and the road to wisdom. I grab this opportunity to inform you that Greek universities offer a series of high-level academic programs in different fields to younger generations of Greeks abroad and foreigners willing to get familiar with the Greek language and culture. Last but not least, I would warmly like to thank again the UCLA Stavros Niakos Foundation Center for the study of Hellenic culture for the invaluable support to promote Greek culture and organize today's event. I'm looking forward to Professor Morgan's lecture. Thank you. We will now listen to the second message by the Deputy Minister for Diaspora Greeks, Mr. Konstantinos Vlasis. Η ημέρα εορτασμού της ελληνικής γλώσσας δεν αποτελεί απλώς μία υπενθύμηση της αδιάλειπτης συνέχειας της γλώσσας μας τον χρόνο, αλλά και μία αναγνώριση της διαχρονικής συνεισφοράς της στο παγκόσμιο γίγνεσθε. Σε αυτήν ακριβώς την αναγνώριση βρίσκεται η ουσία της καθιέρωσης του ετήσιου εορτασμού της. Η ελληνική γλώσσα μετρά περισσότερα από 5.000 χρόνια ζωής από την πρωτοελληνική μορφή της περίπου το 3.000 π.Χ. έως σήμερα. Παρά τις πολλές αναπροσαρμογές της στο διάβα των αιώνων, αποτελεί το νήμα που συνδέει τις σημειακές στιγμές χιλιάδων ετών σε μία ενιαία ιστορική χρονογραμμή. Η ιστορικότητά της ταξιδεύει τόσο βαθιά μέσα στον χρόνο, ώστε να της αποδίδονται αναντήρητα τα σκύπτρα της γλώσσας που κωδικοποίησε πρώτη ανώτερες λεξιλογικές αναφορές τόσο σε αφηρημένε όσο και σε τεχνικές έννοιες, που καθιέρωσε οικονομικές αξίες και που θεμελίωσε και διαμόρφωσε το ενιολόγιο του δυτικού πολιτισμού. Σύμφωνα με τη Γαλλίδα Ακαδημαϊκό και Ελληνίστρια Ζακλίν Ντεγομιγή, αν η Ελλάδα ζητούσε να αφαιρέσουμε από την γλώσσα μας τις ελληνικές λέξεις που μας δάνεισε, ο δυτικό πολιτισμός θα κατέρε. Αυτή η παρακαταθήκη αποτελεί ένα αδιάσιστο πολλαπλασιαστή, ήπιας μεν, αλλά δομικής ισχύως για την χώρα μας. Η ελληνική γλώσσα είναι συνέστημα, άρρηκτα συνδεδεμένη με την ελληνική εθνική ταυτότητα, την καρδιά και το νου των Ελλήνων, οι οποίοι στις λέξεις της ανακάλυψαν τη μαγεία της έκφρασης του πλούσιου ψυχικού κόσμου τους. Στις λέξεις της βρήκαν τον τρόπο να εδραιώνονται στον χρόνο και να δημιουργούν. Η ελληνική γλώσσα είναι γλώσσα ποιητική. Εύλογα η Ελλάδα σεμνύεται διαγρονικά για τα δύο βραβεία Νόμπελ που της χάρισαν ο Γεώργιος Εφέρης και ο Οδυσσέας Ελίτης σμιλεύοντας τις λέξεις κατά τρόπο μοναδικό. Είναι η γλώσσα του Διονύσου Σολομού, ο οποίος μας χάρισε τον ύμνο στην ελευθερία, τον εθνικό μας ύμνο. Τιμώντας κάθε χρόνο στις 9 Φεβρουαρίου τη μνήμη του εθνικού μας ποιητή, θυμόμαστε τα λόγια του. Μίγαρης έχω άλλο στο νου μου, πάρεξ ελευθερία και γλώσσα. Η άριστη γνώση της Ιταλικής και η μακρά παραμονή του στην Ιταλία δεν στάθηκαν ποτέ εμπόδιο στην εξιστόρηση της αισθητικής, γλωσσικής και βιωματικής πορεία του στα ελληνικά. Εξιστόρηση η οποία άφησε χαραγμένο το αποτύπωμά της στη γέννηση της σύγχρονης Ελλάδας. Τα εκατομμύρια των Ελλήνων και πολλών φιλελλήνων σε κάθε γωνιά της γης σήμερα αποτελούν ζωντανό παράδειγμα της απαράμιλης γοητείας της. Το χαρακτηριστικό ωστόσο που κάνει την γλώσσα μας μοναδική είναι ότι αποτελεί στάση ζωής. Οι Έλληνες στην προσπάθειά τους να ερμηνεύσουν τον κόσμο δημιούργησαν λέξεις οι οποίες έχουν την ιδιότητα να δίνουν νόημα στην ύπαρξη, να οδηγούν στην διαπίστωση του πραγματικού, του υπαρκτού αλλά και του υπερβατικού. Λέξεις που αποδίδουν με ακρίβεια αυθύπαρκτες έννοιες, ιδέες και αξίες. Δημοκρατία, φιλοσοφία, διαλογός, αγαθό εργία. Το χαρακτηριστικό αυτό 
διατρέχει την ελληνική γλώσσα σε όλη την ιστορική της πορεία. Μέσω της ελληνικής γλώσσας, της γλώσσας των Ευαγγελίων και των πατερικών κειμένων της Εκκλησίας, διαδόθηκε και συνεχίζει να διαδίδεται ως σήμερα το πανανθρώπινο μήνυμα της αλήθειας, της πίστεως, της αγάπης και της ειρήνης. Από την εποχή που μίλησε ο Όμηρος ως σήμερα, μιλούμε, ανασένουμε και τραγουδούμε την ίδια γλώσσα, γράφει ο Γεώργιος Σεφέρης, αποδίδοντας λιτά και παραστατικά την διαχρονικότητα, τον συναισθηματικό πλούτο και την στάση απέναντι στη ζωή και στην ουσία, όπως αντανακλώνται στην ελληνική γλώσσα. Η διδασκαλία της αποτελεί καθήκον όλων μας για τη διατήρηση και τη διάδοση του ελληνικού πολιτισμού. The third message will be by Secretary General for Public Diplomacy and Greeks Abroad, Professor John Chrysoulakis. Κάθε χρόνο στις 9 Φεβρουαρίου γιορτάζουμε την Παγκόσμια ημέρα της ελληνικής γλώσσας, μια ημερομηνία που θεσπίστηκε στη μνήμη του Διονύσιου Σολομού. Το πείμα του «Ήμνωση στην ελευθερία» αποκτά ειδικά φέτος ιδιαίτερη βαρύτητα. Το 2021 είναι η επαιτειακή χρονιά εορτασμού των 200 ετών από την Ελληνική Επανάσταση του 1821. Τη γλώσσα μου έδωσαν ελληνική. Μονάχη έγνοια η γλώσσα μου στις αμμουδιές του ομήρου. Οι διάσημοι αυτοί στίχοι θα γραφτούν κοντά έναν αιώνα μετά την καθιέρωση του εθνικού μας ύμνου. Ποιητής, αυτήν τη φορά, ο νομπελίστας Οδυσσέας Ελίτης στο Άξιο Νεστή. Οι γραφές του θυμίζουν τον νοερό δεσμό μεταξύ της ελληνικής γλώσσας και των απανταχού Ελλήνων, αλλά και όσων αισθάνονται Έλληνες, διότι μαθαίνουν, διδάσκουν και αγαπούν την ελληνική γλώσσα. Σε αυτήν είναι αφιερωμένε για μια ακόμη χρονιά οι εκδηλώσεις που διοργανώνονται από όλε τις αρχές στο εξωτερικό. Στη Γενική Γραμματεία Δημόσιας Διπλωματίας και Απόδημου Ελληνισμού χαιρετίζουμε τις πρωτοβουλίες για τον εορτασμό της Παγκόσμιας Υμέρας Ελληνικής Γλώσσας. Η ελληνική είναι η κοινή γλώσσα για όλους τους Έλληνες και τις Ελληνίδες όπου και αν βρίσκονται στον κόσμο. Είναι ο φορέας του ελληνικού, του ευρωπαϊκού και του δυτικού πολιτισμού μέσα από τις επιστήμες και τις τέχνες. Είναι οι λέξεις και οι έννοιες που από τα αρχαία ελληνικά εμποτίζουν τόσες άλλες γλώσσες του πλανήτη. Είναι τα σύμβολα στα μαθηματικά, στο ελληνικό αλφάβητο, στις επιγραφές των μνημείων που δεσπόζουν παντού στη Μεσόγειο. Η ελληνική γλώσσα είναι οι ιδέες, είναι ο πλούτος της σκέψης και του ορθού λόγου. Είναι η γλώσσα της έκφρασης αισθημάτων, της παρατήρησης, η γλώσσα της αποτύπωσης του ανθρώπινου νου και των επιστημονικών επιτευγμάτων. Είναι η κάθε λέξη, η δική σας ελληνική λέξη, με την οποία ταυτίζεστε και η οποία εσαρκώνει την ελληνικότητα για εσάς. Μα πάνω και πέρα απ' όλα είναι το κοινό σημείο που ενώνει όλους εμάς στο σήμερα με το χθες της ελληνικότητάς μας ανά τους αιώνες. Τους Έλληνες της Ελλάδας, τους Έλληνες της Ομογένειας, τους φίλους της ελληνικής γλώσσας. Ας γιορτάσουμε όλοι μαζί την Παγκόσμια ημέρα ελληνικής γλώσσας 2021. Χρόνια πολλά στα ελληνικά. Now we will proceed to the second and main part of today's event, the lecture Know Thyself, Ancient Proverbs and the Road to Wisdom uh, by Catherine Morgan, Professor of Classics at UCLA. The speaker will, will be introduced by the director of our center, Professor Sharon Gerstel. Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Gerstel and I'm director of the UCLA Stavros Niarchos Foundation Center for the Study of Hellenic Culture. I want to express my sincerest thanks to Evgenia Benyatoglu, the Consul General of Greece in Los Angeles, for asking our center to assist the consulate in the celebration of this very special event. And in particular, I would like to thank Dr. Simo Zenios, Associate Director of our center, 
and Mr. Andrea Spiro, Head of Public Diplomacy Office at the Consulate, as well as Christina Baruti, Public Diplomacy Officer, for working out the details of this, our second annual celebration. I would also like to thank Deputy Minister Vlasis and Secretary General Hurzoulakis for their warm support and for their opening remarks. Thank you though, all for being here today. At the end of last year's celebration, many of you know we cut the centers of Asilopida and I'm sincerely looking forward to gathering together again in person next year at this time to wish everyone a happy and healthy new year. And now it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Catherine Morgan, who will deliver this year's address. Catherine Morgan received her BA from Bryn Mawr College and her PhD in classics from the University of California at Berkeley. As part of her studies, she spent two years in Athens at the American School of Classical Studies. She came to teach at UCLA in 1996 and in 2004 received the Distinguished Teaching Award from both UCLA and from the American Philological Association. She is a scholar of ancient Greek literature and intellectual history, whose research focuses on the philosophy of the classical period, especially Plato, and on lyric poetry, as well as the cultural systems into which lyric and philosophy are embedded. She is the author of Myth and Philosophy from the Pre-Socratics to Plato and Pindar, and the construction of Syracusan monarchy in the fifth century BC. Her current book project examines Plato's polemical engagement with the great history of Thucydides. I want to thank, uh, take a moment to thank Professor Morgan, who has only recently completed her term as chair of the Department of Classics for her stalwart support of the UCLA SNF Hellenic Center. Catherine Morgan was one of the four core faculty members who initially approached the foundation to establish this center. And I have come to rely on her level mind, warm engagement with the community and sage advice in running our programs. So it's especially delightful for me that Catherine is with us today as the speaker for the celebration. So now sit back and with me, I look forward to hearing Professor Morgan lecturing on Know Thyself, Ancient Proverbs, and the Road to Wisdom. Catherine. So I would like to start by thanking Sharon for her very kind introduction, and also by thanking Evgenia Beniakoglu, Konstantinos Vlasis, and Jean Krisoulakis for their opening remarks. It's an honor to be speaking to you this afternoon on the occasion of, on the occasion of International Greek Language Day. And I bring you the warm greetings of faculty and students in the Department of Classics here at UCLA, where the celebration of the Greek language takes place on a daily basis. My talk today explores how some small units of the ancient Greek language, maxims or proverbs, circulated within ancient Greek culture and enjoyed a lively afterlife and in particular how one, the Delphic command, know thyself, took on an enhanced importance within the Greek philosophical tradition. At the same time, I want to play a little with the notion of the road, investigating the connections between travel and intellectual cultivation. Because maxims are short and memorable, they travel easily. And we shall see how collections of wise sayings were diffused geographically in the Greek heartlands and then even farther afield. We will start in Delphi and end in Afghanistan, a tribute, I hope, to the international component of International Greek Language Day. Let's start with Pausanias and with Delphi, the home of Apollo and his oracle and the navel of the world for the ancient Greeks. In the second century of our era, the traveler Pausanias wrote a guidebook to Greece and told his readers that in the front porch of the temple at Delphi, sayings useful to humanity are written. They were written by the men the Greeks call sages, that's wise men or sophoi. 
these men came to Delphi and dedicated to Apollo the famous sayings, know thyself and nothing too much. That's Gnothi Sauton and Meden Agan. These inscriptions were much discussed in antiquity, as we'll see. Opinions differed on whether Apollo revealed them to the wise men or whether the wise men came up with them by themselves. Pausanias belongs to the latter camp, as does Plato. And if we follow this path, we can note an interesting aspect of early Greek wisdom traditions. The insistence that knowledge should be useful. These are not people who keep their wisdom to themselves, but who share it. It was the nature of a Greek religious dedication that it was firstly a tribute to the God who had favored a dedicant, and secondly, a form of display, of communication. You wanted everyone who came to the sanctuary to see what you had dedicated. It said something about you, your piety, your achievement. The achievement of the sages was intellectual and they condensed it into something small and precious. Unfortunately, we don't have very good information on precisely where these inscriptions were and what form they took. The temple of Apollo in Pausanias' day had been rebuilt several times since the time of the sages, and so the location could have changed. But we are told that they were in the front porch. Some think that they were inscribed on the temple itself and some on pillars near the entrance to the interior. Both inscriptions insist that we think mortal thoughts. Nothing too much advises moderation and know thyself, whatever implications it had later on, reminded you that you were a mortal, not a God, that you had to avoid arrogance and hubris. Greek mythology was full of the sticky fates of those who did not remember this simple rule. As Pindar would say, do not seek to become Zeus. This knowledge of the limits of your situation was an important part of what the Greeks called sophrosyne, safe thinking or moderation. Greek culture was agonistic, with individuals constantly striving to be the best, but you had to be careful not to get carried away. Knowing your mortal limits helped you to deal safely with success and could even be thought to contribute to that success. Pindar says to King Hieron of Syracuse, victor in a prestigious chariot race, learn what you are and become it. This is what will enable further success and ensure divine favor. Plutarch, writing a century or so before Pausanias, reinforces this interpretation when he writes about the Delphic Maxims. The God addresses each of us in welcome as we approach with the words, know thyself, a reminder to mortals of their nature and weakness. He interprets it as a form of greeting, like hierete, only more useful. I'm struck too by the phrase, as we approach. He's imagining us walking into the temple and reading the inscription as we move. The command, and its interpretation a part of a process as we move. For Plutarch, though, these inscriptions are more than just useful advice. They are the seeds of philosophical investigation from which a mass of logoi, discourse, arises. In a dialogue he writes about the seven wise men, he has a character ask them what they think the meaning of know thyself and nothing too much is. For thoughtful intellectuals during the Roman Empire, the meaning wasn't self-evident, but it had to be carefully teased out. This is why Plutarch concludes, the god is no less a philosopher than a prophet. Who were these wise men? There were many candidates throughout antiquity, at least 17 of them and the list de changed depending on who was doing the listing. They were, as we might say on Super Bowl day, intellectual all-stars, 
forming a kaleidoscopic list that could change over the centuries as different kinds of intellectuals were valued and quoted. And I'm going to return to this later. We don't even know when they first became a collection of seven in Greece, though there were groups of seven wise men in Babylonian, Sanskrit, and Chinese tradition. In Greek literature, Plato is the first to mention the seven wise men. But in the early period, several names keep recurring. Thales of Miletus, Bias of Priene, Pittacus of Mytilene, Solon of Athens, Cleobulos of Lindos, Periander of Corinth, and Chilon of Sparta. Now, Plato replaced Periander, who was a tyrant, with Myson because Plato didn't like tyrants. Four names from this list belong to men from the islands and the coast of Ionia, and three to the mainland. All belong to the late seventh and sixth centuries BC. From the very start, this is an Aegean network, and many traditions have the Sophoi traveling and meeting each other in various places. If you look at the picture on the right of the screen, you will see a mosaic from the Roman imperial period, from Baalbek, in Lebanon. In the middle is the muse of philosophy, Calliope, and she is surrounded by the seven sages who are all labeled for our convenience. Interestingly though, there are eight roundels. At 12 o'clock, we can see a picture of Socrates. Sorry about the definition, that was the best picture I could find. Uh, he's joined the sages and as we will see for good reason. As time went by, the sayings of the sages proliferated far beyond the two maxims that I've mentioned. By the later fourth century, scholars belonging to the school of Aristotle were researching the sages and their sayings were being collected into anthologies. Demetrius of Phaleron compiled a list of sayings for each sage. And this was the source for what I put up on the screen for you. Know thyself, nothing too much give a pledge and suffer for it. Know your opportunity. Most people are bad. Measure is best. Practice is everything. Or as I've seen one translation say, practice makes perfect. My favorite in this list, because so true, is people are bad. The most obscure perhaps is give a pledge and suffer for it, or in another translation, give a pledge, ruin follows. Plutarch has a character comment that this saying has kept many from marrying and many from trusting and some even from, from speaking. There was also said to have been a contest of the seven sages and this exists in many versions. To put it most simply, an object, a cup, or a tripod is set up as a prize of wisdom. It is offered to each of the seven sages in turn. Each rejects it on the grounds that he is not the wisest until it reaches the first again. The object is then dedicated to a god, usually Apollo. In a version told by Callimachus, a man called Bathycles leaves a golden cup to the greatest of the seven sages. The cup goes the rounds, starting and finishing with Thales, who dedicates it to Apollo of Didyma. Diogenes Laertius tells a version where the tripod is the prize. It starts with Thales, but finishes with Solon, who comments that the god is most wise and sends it to Delphi, to Apollo. I want to point out the combination of contest and humility in these anecdotes. The wise men know their limits. They know they're part of a network of thinkers that stretches across the world they know. This is the point of the circulation of the prize. They're characterized also by Sofrosine, recognizing the claims of other experts and understanding the gap that separates them from divine knowledge. It's the God who is wise. By dedicating the prize to the god, they display their safe thinking to the wider community. 
The maxim, know thyself, dedicated to the God, is parallel to the prize. By circulating the prize, they are exercising self-knowledge. In his dialogue Protagoras, Plato has Socrates narrate the story of the dedication of the maxims at Delphi, stressing their brevity. It's an odd passage, and we don't have time to do it justice here, but we can pull out some points of interest. It's a playful story. Socrates insists to his audience in Athens, and this is an audience of the foremost intellectuals of his day, that it's really the Spartans who are the best philosophers. Spartans, of course, were famed for being laconic, men of few words. Socrates tells how in the middle of a conversation, a Spartan can be relied upon to make a devastating remark, short and compressed, that makes his interlocutor seem little better than a child. He concludes that some have realized that laconizing is more a matter of loving wisdom than gymnastics, knowing that the ability to pronounce such sayings is the mark of a perfectly educated man. Belonging to this group were, and here's our list, Thales, Pittacus, Bias, our own Solon, Cleobulos, Myson, and the seventh of them was said to be Chilon. All of these were students, emulators, and lovers of Lacedaemonian culture. And one could learn this by observing that their wisdom is of this sort. Each of them spoke short sayings and ones worth remembering. These men also came together and dedicated in common to Apollo at his temple in Delphi, the first fruits of their wisdom, writing those sayings that everyone praises, know thyself and nothing to excess. This is, in many ways, an attractive vision, but also one calculated to infuriate his listeners who are not Spartan and who have shown a regrettable tendency to long speechifying that Socrates wants to curtail. In this vision, the perfectly educated person has only to compose or quote a pity soundbite, and he can show himself superior. It's a conservative vision, one in which Delphic wisdom and its equivalent wins out over intellectual nitpicking. Yet, of course, this isn't the whole story. The trouble with maxims is that they can be difficult to interpret. How do we know that we've got the message right? Thus, the participants in the conversation in the Protagoras have a long and fruitless discussion on what Pittacus meant when he said, it is hard to be good. The first book of Plato's Republic finds problematic the saying, justice is giving each his due, attributed to the wise poet Simonides. In the works of Xenophon, at least two characters fail by thinking they know the meaning of the saying, know thyself. In a conversation with Euthydemus, who's at a loss about how to improve himself, Socrates tries to convince his young friend that knowing oneself is the path to success in life. But Euthydemus has never paid attention to the Delphic command to know himself because, he says, I felt sure that I knew that already, for I could hardly know anything else if I did not even know myself. In the education of Cyrus, Croesus, the defeated king of Lydia, tells Cyrus that the oracle at Delphi had told him, knowing yourself, you will live a happy life. His reaction, I was glad, because I thought this was very easy. I thought that every person knows who he is, but of course he doesn't. He doesn't know his own limits. He attacks the superior king, Cyrus of Persia, and he comes to grief. Could it be that knowing yourself is really rather difficult? The problem recurs in the dialogue Charmides, which is a discussion of sophrosine, safe-mindedness. While young Charmides declares that sophrosine is conducting one's own affairs, 
Critias argues that sophrosune is self-knowledge and refers to the Delphic maxim, know thyself in support. Socrates, as we might have expected, interprets sophrosune more along the lines of knowing your own ignorance. Socrates takes the Delphic maxim very seriously. In the Apology, he tries to explain to the jury judging him why he spends his whole life annoying the Athenians by exposing their ignorance. He tells how a friend asked the Delphic Oracle whether there was anyone wiser than Socrates, and the Oracle replied that there was no one wiser. But Socrates is unwilling to let matters rest there. He doesn't know what the Oracle means because he knows he's not wise, but he also knows that the God shouldn't be telling a lie. So he examines the truth of the Oracle by testing the wisdom of the people he meets with notorious results. He learns that reputations for wisdom are unjustified. His wisdom therefore consists in his knowledge that he knows nothing. His conclusion is that the God is wise. And in this oracle, he wishes to say this, that human wisdom is worth little or nothing. Note that this conclusion is identical to the one reached by Solon in the story of the contest of the seven sages. Because he knows himself, Socrates is intellectually humble and knows his place. This quest for self-knowledge prevents him from engaging in intellectual wild goose chases. In the Phaedrus, he refuses to engage in allegorical speculation about the meaning of myth because he has still not yet learned to know himself, whether he is a more complex beast than Typhon or a gentler and simpler creature. It seems that Plutarch was right that the Delphic inscriptions could set philosophical inquiries in motion. This is the metaphorical road to wisdom of my title. Perhaps the most productive proverbs are the ones that make us think. The danger of investing too much in sound bites is that they can encourage us to become complacent, think that we know it all. When we do this, we disobey the Delphic command to know ourselves. A proverb is both an opportunity and a danger because from a Socratic perspective, wisdom is only really wisdom when we own it and understand it. The language of brevity has its uses, but it also has its seductions to be resisted. Socrates and the thinkers of his time looked back to a wisdom tradition that they must both respect and contest the same goes for Socrates' pupil Plato and Plato's pupil Aristotle. All must grapple with the role of conventional wisdom in everyday life and in intellectual inquiry. And when each generation does this, they in turn set themselves up as wise men, or at least as aspiring to the status of wise man, that is, philosopher. This is why I find the mosaic on the right-hand side of the screen intriguing. Uh, it comes from Pompeii and has been variously interpreted as the meeting of the seven sages or as a meeting in Plato's academy. It's difficult to tell which is right because each group performs a similar role. The philosopher then, must look below the surface of language and beat a new path. What about the rest of us? For all the emphasis in Plato on thinking for oneself and self-examination, there was a recognized need for easily digestible wisdom that could be purveyed to the person in the street. A philosophical dialogue not by Plato called the Hipparchus discusses the activities of Hipparchus, a member of the tyranny that ruled Athens in the second half of the sixth century BC. It tells how he set up herm statues. Now, a herm is a pillar with an erect phallus and a head of the god Hermes on top. Hermes is the god of travel 
And so these are often set up at entrances and exits and on the road. We are told that Hipparchus set up herms along the roads midway between the city and each of the deans. And then after selecting from his own wisdom what he thought was the wisest, he inscribed it in his own elegiac compositions. So that in the first place, his citizens should not admire those wise Delphic instructions, know thyself and nothing too much, and the other sayings of that sort, but should rather consider wise the sayings of Hipparchus. There are two inscriptions. On the left side of each herm, Hermes is inscribed as saying that he stands midway between the city and the dean. And on the right side, he says, this is a memorial of Hipparchus, walk with just intent. Note how the motif of competition reemerges here. Hipparchus the tyrant is not interested in knowing himself or making a dedication at Delphi. He wants to memorialize himself and compete with Delphi. We may well suspect that things won't end well for Hipparchus. And indeed, most readers would have known that historically he was killed by the Athenian tyrannicides. The dialogue is clear that his project is both educational and self-aggrandizing. As we walk along the road, we're encouraged to think just thoughts or to refrain in another example from deceiving a friend. These are very straightforward maxims and perhaps less conducive than others to thoughtful investigation. We might suspect that the author of the dialogue is making all this up, but wait. What is surprising and wonderful to me at least is that this seems to have a real historical basis. In 1729, an inscription was discovered in the village of Koropi, midway between Athens and the ancient deem of Kephale. So you can see Koropi, the black arrow at the top, in the middle of the screen, the top arrow, and then the approximate location of ancient Kephale near modern Keratea with the bottom arrow. This herm, this inscription, was subsequently lost and rediscovered in 1935-6 in the school building at Koropi. It had previously been used as part of a church. You can just see the remains of the sign of the cross here. But enough survived to see what it once was. On the right-hand side of the screen, I've shown you a well-preserved herm from Sifnos. And on the left, what is left, the sad remnants of the Koropi herm. Here's a close up of the inscription and reads in the middle of Kephale and the town, radiant Hermes. The other side has not survived, but we can supply what it would have said. This is a memorial of Hipparchus and then there would have been a maxim. So a late sixth century Athenian princeling with intellectual and educational aspirations really did sow his proverbial wisdom all over the Attic countryside, like little stone flowers. And now our road has become a real road from one place to another. So walking from Athens to Kephale would have been a real education. Later on, around 430 BC, the sculptor Alcamenes created a famous Hermes Propuleios, Hermes at the gate, for the Athenian Acropolis. The original hasn't survived, but I show you here a later copy. You should look careful at carefully at where the red arrow is pointing. With luck, you can make out Gnathi Sauton, know thyself. Here's the dedicatory inscription that identifies the statue type and the maxim as well. Perhaps if we had more herms from antiquity, we would find more proverbs engaged on them, sorry, engraved on them. And again, note that this wisdom is designed to be displayed at a point of transition. It's something you take along with you as you walk. 
as we move into the fourth century and later, we find the educational use of maxims proliferating even further. From a gymnasium on Thera, dating to the fourth century, we have a fragmentary inscription with four maxims, three of which are maxims of the sages that we've already encountered. Give a pledge and suffer for it. Nothing too much. Know thyself. You put this in the gymnasium so that citizens can be confronted on a daily basis with traditional wisdom. From Kizikus, a Greek colony on the Sea of Marmara comes an inscription from around 300 BC with dozens of sayings of the wise men. Praise virtue, practice justice, govern your wife, pursue reputation, master pleasure. This is now almost a kind of encyclopedia and the educational purpose is the same. This too may have come from a gymnasium. During the Roman Empire, and doubtless before then as well, proverb collections were so pervasive that they could be given to schoolboys as a moral exercise and as writing practice, as we see here in an Egyptian papyrus with the sayings of the wise men held in the University of Athens. Some of these are, follow God, obey the good, worship the gods, respect your parents. But the most wonderful of all is an inscription found in Afghanistan at Ai Kanu. This may be the ancient city of Alexandria on the Oxus, founded by Alexander the Great or by one of his successors in Bactria. The site is marked on this map right in the middle. And here's a computer reconstruction of the remains on the left-hand side and a photo of the excavations on the right. Apparently they were much damaged during the uh, fighting between the Soviets and the Taliban. This site was excavated from 1965 to 1978 by the French. And during their second season, they found an inscribed stone on the front porch of the funerary monument of Kyneas who was probably the founder of the city. Here's a photo of the stone, as well as a herm of the official in charge of the gymnasium in this outpost of Hellenic civilization. If you look carefully, you can see two sets of writing, one on the left and one on the right. On the left, is the dedicatory inscription. These wise words of men of old are set up in most holy Pytho, that's Delphi, as sayings of famous men. There, Clearchus wrote them down meticulously and dedicated them in the shrine of Kyneus to shine afar. On the right, we read, as a child, be well behaved, as a youth, be self-controlled, in middle age, be just. As an old man, be well advised. At death, be without sorrow. The stone was the base for a stele on which the maxims were written. Because of lack of space on the stele itself, the stone cutter wrote the last five maxims on the remaining space of the base and the stele itself is entirely lost. We can recognize the maxims preserved here from the end of other preserved lists of the maxims of the sages at Delphi. But it's the first inscription that for me is the most fascinating. We're told that a Clearchus copied the maxims from a master list at Delphi and brought them all the way out here. He must have thought that he was bringing the treasure of Hellenic civilization with him along the long road from mainland Greece. He wants them to shine out from the tomb of the founder of the city. And even more exciting is the possibility, and it must unfortunately be no more than a possibility, that this Clearchus is Clearchus of Soli, who belonged to Aristotle's school of peripatetics, who wrote about Eastern cultures, and who also wrote about, of course, the contest of the seven stages. 
The inscription also shows, I think, that a new and more extensive collection of the sayings of the sages had been erected at Delphi by the late fourth century BC. These sayings moved from the navel of the Greek world and the shrine that had always played an important role in Greek colonization to Bactria due to the literally peripatetic zeal of a philosopher on a mission, as he saw it, to educate and civilize. This is a long road indeed. I want to finish with a brief foray into the Christian world and the role of the sages there. In the first centuries of Christianity, theologians tried their best to accommodate the wisdom of the past to the new demands of the present. And one of their tactics was to suggest that enlightened pagans would have had some presentiment about the coming divine redemption of the world. So the theologians created prophecies and who better to, suited to be their mouthpiece than the wise men of old. There are several treatises that have the wise men meet, sometimes in front of a temple. They either ask Apollo about the future or ponder themselves what the future will bring. And then they or Apollo prophesy the incarnation of Christ. One of these works is called On the Temple in Athens and was attributed to Athanasius the Great. The author advises that in order to convert educated pagans, one should use the prophecies of ancient sages that announce the coming of Christ. He tells how the sages met in front of a temple to ask Apollo, who's now a human, of course, rather than a god, to prophesy. And he tells of the birth of Christ from Mary. Each of the sages then gives a follow-up prophecy along the same lines. The sages mentioned in this text, however, have changed a lot from the list that we started with at the beginning of this talk. They are now Bias, Solon, Chilon, Thucydides, Menander, Plato, and Titan. Indeed, these early Christian sage lists are a strange and wonderful mix of personalities. Here is our original list of our archaic sages. Here is a list from a manuscript in Athens which has none of the originals, but a mix of ancient poets and philosophers and some names like Bleomedes that we don't recognize at all. Note Homer, Plato, Aristotle, and Plutarch. Here's the list from Pseudo-Athanasius. And here, finally, is the group of sages as we see them in 17th century frescoes at the monastery of Eviron on Mount Athos, where two of our original sages have returned, that's Chilon and, and uh, Solon, and we have three philosophers, one historian, and one tragic poet. And here are Aristotle and Chilon from these frescoes. The wisdom of the past has now expanded and become synchronic. Towering figures of Greek literature and thought are grouped together, regardless of when they lived, as expressions of the wisdom of antiquity and as tokens of the way that that heritage could be accommodated to a new Christian tradition. In the monastery paintings, the scrolls they hold contain their prophecies of the incarnation, not the famous sayings with which they were associated in antiquity. Paradoxically, this development brings us back in an inverted kind of way to Plutarch, he said, you'll remember, that the God is no less a philosopher than a prophet. These Christianized sages have become no less prophets than philosophers. Each age creates its own road to wisdom. And so the road goes ever on. The legacy of the Greek language and the cultures it expressed has moved from Greece both eastwards and westwards. The material we've looked at today, though, teaches us the importance 
of thinking about the nature of that journey. The Delphic commands to know thyself can still help us with moderation and with safe thinking. It should remind us to be intellectually humble, to listen carefully to other opinions, explore our own arrogance and ignorance, not to think that we know it all. To recall, as Socrates and the sages would have said, the gap between human and divine wisdom. Pieces of cultural tradition are seeds for further thought, not an end product in themselves. Thinking carefully about the meaning of traditional wisdom is not an easy road, but a difficult one. And so I'm going to leave you with the words of Hesiod. Between us and excellence, the immortal gods have placed sweat. Long and steep is the path to it, and it is rough at first. But when someone arrives at the top, then it is easy, though it was hard before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, this very rich, uh, very uh, stimulating talk, which took us from archaic Greece to up to the 17th century. So at this point, I would like you to join me in thanking uh, Professor Morgan for this uh, very rich, very wide ranging uh, talk, which took us across many, many centuries and many geographical contexts. And uh, I think in this way, it was uh, the most suitable topic we could have had for a day in which we celebrate the diversity and, and uh, long life uh, of the Greek language. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, I want to thank every one of you uh, for being here. And I would like again to repeat my thanks to the co-sponsors of this event, the General Secretariat for Public Di Diplomacy and Greeks Abroad of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Hellenic Republic and the Consulate General of Greece in Los Angeles. It was a pleasure to uh, welcome you all today and we look forward to seeing you in our upcoming events that celebrate in one way or another uh, the richness of Greek culture and Greek language.